Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another rollicking, frolicking episode of Mondays with Mundy, and that's me, Jim Mundy, the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation at the Union League of Philadelphia. All right. Um, everybody knows I'm an architecture geek. I admit it, and I enjoy it, And but it's not just the architecture. It's also what things used to look like once upon a time, and the League has something called the Broad Street Building, which is an amazing piece of architecture and design from 1865. But it, you know, it didn't always look the way it does today. So I thought we would take a little stroll through the building, or at least uh, two of the three floors of it that we can see, and uh, look at what the rooms used to look like once upon a time, and then see what they look like today. So let's let's start. So I have to do a PowerPoint. So I'm going to share the screen. Okay, I do that. I hit share, and then I have to go up here to slideshow, and then I hit from the beginning. Okay, looks like it worked again. Fingers crossed, because I didn't the last time. <laughs> okay, all right. So I'm calling it then and now, the Broad Street Building over the years. Okay, let's start with the Broad Street Building. Makes sense, right? This, I think, is the earliest photograph taken of the building itself. This is approximately 1866. The building opened May the 11th of 1865, and there are a number of line drawings uh, made of the building, but this is the first photograph. And as you can see, and I will ask you, do you see any differences between then and now? I, I think the facade itself is pretty much intact on Broad Street, but there are some other changes that you need to notice. So, but anyway, this is what the building looks like today. Okay, and there are some differences. So we'll see how good you are at noticing, noticing them over time. All right, I'll give you next, another second or two to see if you see anything different. All right, here goes. All right, well, you walk in the door. A, either door, you see the hallway. So I thought I would start with the hallway, but actually let's go back. This, is, this map is from 1890, it's an insurance survey. And this is what the first floor of the building looks like at that point in time. So room number one in the lower right-hand corner uh, today is what we call the North Lounge, all right? Room number three is actually the bar of the old cafe, which is number four, and the old cafe is there, all right? Number five is a hallway that no longer exists. Now it's part of the larger Cafe Meredith, but in the 19th century, that hallway separated room number six from room number seven and the hallway between connected though, okay? So you go from the hall number eight through number five, the hallway into room number seven, which today is the Wi-Fi Cafe. Number six today is the Cafe Murda. okay? But when you get to the 21st century, that doorway doesn't separate number six and number five anymore, okay? It's the hallway always the hallway, all right? Nine, today is the business center. Back then it was a restaurant. The pantry no longer exists. Obviously the coat room and the whole toilet facility there and the coat room are, are all changed, but you know what they look like today. And number two is the smoking room. It was a smoking room back then and it's a smoking room today, kind of neat. All right, so having said that, let's move on to our first image. And this is the hallway itself. Now this photograph was taken in 1887 by a a studio called Gilbert and Bacon, and they, they were hired by the lake to photograph the building as it existed at that time. Keep in mind, in 1887, it included something called the Annex, but we're not going to go there today. We're strictly speaking and talking about and looking at the Broad Street building itself. So um, if we were at the west end of the hallway, keep in mind the league building goes east and west from Broad to 15th Street. Okay, let me go back. So at the very top of your photograph, you see that number eight. That's about where the photographer is standing when he took the photograph, okay? All right, so he's looking from west to east. You can see that brilliant sunlight coming in at the east end on the far left-hand side, all right? The door on the right is the door to the restaurant, all right? Today, it's the doorway to the business center, all right? So there were two doors in the restaurant, so obviously the second door doesn't exist anymore. Uh, you'll notice those large upholstered benches. We still have them. There are two of them left in the building. There are two are in storage. And if you walk up the grand staircase that you can see in the distance on the left-hand side of the photograph and you get to the top landing, there is one of those upholstered benches, all right? And you'll also notice that on the grand staircase, you see those two torchers, that is the, the robed ladies holding up those lights, okay? They were there back then and we'll see there now. Also look at the ceiling, it's plain painted plaster, okay? You'll also look at the wall of the hallway. You can see that rather than using wallpaper, they used paint, color, and stenciling to give the hallway a design, right? So, uh, and that's what they relied on in the 19th century. Actually, wallpaper didn't come into play until really the, uh, the 1960s. So, 
so there we are. And you see the marble floor, all right? The same marble floor today and that tessellate, that's called tessellation, that pattern that you see on the floor there, all right? So here we go. That's the hallway in 1887. And here's, here's the hallway in 1902, that is 1902, forgive me. Um, what's there today that we was there back then? Well, on the lower right-hand corner, obviously, tall case clock, that, that wonderful astrological clock is there, okay? Uh, and it's been there in that place since 1892 and it hasn't moved, all right? Across the hall, you'll see, the, again, those torchairs, uh, the, our beautiful light fixtures, if you will. And you see the grand staircase itself. And in the far right-hand corner of the hallway, you can see the marble, American Morning for Fallen Brave by League member James Henry Hazeltine. She was there then, and guess what? She's back, she's there today, which is kind of neat. What you will also notice, though, is that in 1902, the hallway goes much further than just what we think of as the Broad Street Building, because by then, the League had completed three additional uh, extensions to the to original Broad Street Building. Uh, and what you see there, then, is the hallway that goes down those extensions, okay? So on the right hand side would have been the billiard room, left hand side would have been the new cafe. All right, okay. Uh, oh, take a look at the ceiling. It's changed, all right? Beautifully changed. That wonderful plaster work uh, on the ceiling and those light fixtures. And believe it or not, we actually have one of those light fixtures in our archival collection. So there we go, 1902, all right, to 2006. This is the hallway looking from west to east towards the Broad Street door. And what do we have today? We, well, we have white paint, so we're not quite as decorative or as colorful as we used to be. Uh, the light fixture from the ceiling has changed, obviously. It's not a gasolier anymore. It is a reproduction of a Murano light fixture from Murano, Italy, off of the Venetian, in, the, in the, that little archipelago of islands off of Venice. But we have the torchairs. They're still there. And on the left-hand side of the hallway is the wonderful clock. Okay. Now, added in 1902, but not in the previous photograph, is that wonderful high relief done by Henry Kirkbush Brown on the left-hand side, a monument to the League's nine white Civil War regiments. So, good stuff there. So, that's how things have changed. Okay? All right. Moving on. So, you walk in the Broad Street door and you make a right, and there was the parlor. And this is what it looked like in 1887. So, look how ornately decorated it was. Jeez. I mean, look at that ceiling. That's a frescoed ceiling, hand-painted, frescoed, and, and, and it just marbles. Um, I could talk about that for hours. Uh, fireplace, you'll notice that the mantle is small, white, marble, very plain, and that was typical of the Victorian period because they relied on a large over-mantle piece. It could have been a mirror, as it is here, or a painting, or something like that. In this case, it is a mirror, and you can see how wonderfully molded that, that mirror is. Just good stuff, and you can see the large Vase off to the right-hand side of the mirror behind the table. That gorgeous little picture, that gasolier is just amazing. Um, paintings, art, sculpture. Uh, ah, the clock on the mantelpiece. Guess what? It's a different mantelpiece, but the clock is still there. It's the same clock. Pretty neat. And then in the, what would be the center, left center of the photograph is a doorway with drapery or portieres covering it. And today, that would lead into that little bar area that we call the penalty box or the snug. Okay, so that's that. All right. So of course, the furniture is all gone, unfortunately. Uh, but furniture doesn't last forever. So all right. So that's the parlor in 1887, and here it is in 18 in 1962 when the league celebrated centennial. So in between 1888 and 1892, the league added what we would call paneling, and that's what you see in this photograph. It went from the floor up to the cornice. And of course, then the league added that beautiful cove. It's almost like a very delicate paper mache, and the ceiling changed. Uh, these are concentric circles. And this is the original ceiling that was installed in 1933. And now there's an imitation of it there. But look at that beautiful paneling. Uh, furniture has changed. The, the mantle has definitely changed. Look at that mantle. It's monstrous. I think it's limestone. Uh, big, big, big mantle. Um, same hearth, um, and over the over the mantel we have a painting done by a league member uh, named uh, George Herzog, who is the stenciler, if you will, the decorative artist who painted the building in the 1880s. So that's his work that you will see in some other photographs, as you did the previous one, the ceiling. That was all of his work. Okay, all right. So, and then what does the room look like today? Well, not quite like this today because it's changed since this photograph was taken, but you get the idea though that it was brought up to speed into the 21st century with, with newer furniture, light fixtures, uh, a reproduction ceiling, all right? 
And of course, uh, the window treatments have changed uh, very much so. But on the left-hand side, you'll see that there's that limestone mantle and there is that same clock that was in the photograph of 1887. Pretty neat, okay? All right, we're going to go down the hallway, all right, on the right-hand side. This is the old cafe, as we call it today. Then it was called the cafe. There was no new cafe yet. That's, 18, that's 1893. You can see there are two doors that go into the room, and the door on the left-hand side is into the hallway. You can see the balustrade. You can see the torchere and the banister and the balustrade going up the stairs. All right. Fireplace. Okay. Large overmantel uh, done in brownstone with a carved uh, panel with a UL in the center and these two wonderfully carved griffiths that flank the panel itself. Still there. All right. Over that, you see a freeze, and it only went on the one wall. Uh, we don't know who did it. It was done on paper, apparently, so it deteriorated over time. And it shows the pioneers on the left-hand side, and then more pioneers, uh, you know, landing early pioneers on the left, the kind of Stogel wagons going off to the west on the right-hand side. So uh, you can see the pole in the center that's still there, all right. and also take a look at some of the tables and the chairs. Uh, the table in the left-hand corner, rectangular, still there. It's still in the room. It's not in that particular place. Uh, we also have some of the round tables. We have many of the round tables left, and they're in different parts of the clubhouse. But the chairs, they all disappeared for a long time, uh, and they were made specifically for this room and something called the Oyster Cafe on the ground floor by a cabinet maker named John Raggetts, R-A-G-A-T-Z. Uh, specifically for the room when it opened in 1886. Uh, and we have four of the chairs left. We have three side chairs and one armchair. And you can see the those of both in the right-hand corner. So good stuff there. Okay, so what happens next? 1902, all right? Same furniture, same chairs, same table. They've now added an upholstered circular divan or sofa around the base of the column. Otherwise, uh, the fireplace mantle is still there, as is the overmantle. It looks as if... Uh, the mural over on the south wall over the fireplace itself and over the overmantel has begun to deteriorate a little bit. But you can see that they've added electric lights in the ceiling. And that's what those little light fixtures are. Those are electric lights. Okay. All right. Everybody good? All right. We're moving on. So in 1960, the Union League hired a member named Vincent Kling to be the consulting architect to the league. Now, Vincent Kling was coming up out of what we call the Philadelphia School of Modernism in the 1950s. And Vincent Kling's legacy to Center City Philadelphia architecture is basically concrete office. Uh, think of Penn Center, not concrete, but, but then think of uh, opposite that on the southwest corner of 15th and Market, those two monstrous concrete columns, if you will, and then the municipal services building, right, all concrete. So Kling firm wasn't known for being uh, particularly attuned to historical appearances, all right? That's putting it politely, perhaps, but accurately, I think. So they had a much different approach to, to decoration. So they tried to take the room and make it look like it, like they thought it was a Victorian men's drinking room would have looked like in the 1860s. And even though we had photo documentation, this is what they did. So we have flocked wallpaper on the walls, uh, which never would have been on the walls in the 19th century, but nonetheless, um, we have the same tables, but new chairs. They were brought in in the 19th in the 1960s, 1960s for the room, you can see there's now a bar that has been added on the left-hand side. Okay, but we still have the two doors, all right, left and right. Uh, in the meantime, those little light fixtures you saw in the previous photograph and the ceiling on the cop ring, have, they, they're gone, and now we have these uh, imitation Victorian uh, branched fixtures that you see here in this photograph. And they're gone too today, but you might recognize some of the paintings because so they're still around, all right? So this is, and by the way, the flocked wallpaper was red, and the carpeting has gone from being what we would think of as oriental area rugs to a solid red wool carpet, okay? And the chair color was black. You know, um, I take that back. These chairs are red. I'm thinking of a different chair. So these are red upholstered chairs, okay? All right, and you'll see that, oh, I forgot. Uh, the clock, the, the mantle clock on the mantle, it's still there today, okay? And this is the room in 2020, okay? Same uh, mantle and over mantle. Uh, you can see the coffering is still the same. Uh, but you notice that the tables have changed, but the chairs are 1960s era chairs and then reupholstered. We now have a much 
fancier bar. Great bar, by the way. I think it's the best bar in Center City, Philadelphia. And you can you can trip any over any kind of bottle you want, and, and it's got it's got alcohol in it, and it's in that bar. Uh, in the left hand side, you'll see the pole, and to the right of the pole is a table. That is one of the 1886 tables, as is the one in the right in the far right hand corner, except that the chairs are different. Okay, and of course the frieze around the tops of the walls is also very different. Uh, the members call it the surf and turf freeze because it has a monster at its ear, but it would take too long to explain that one, but some other time perhaps, or you can send me an email, all right? You can all email me at mundj at unionleague.org and I'll explain it to you if you'd like, okay? So that's the old cafe today, one of the, one of the best bar, I think the best bar in Center City. All right, so a little further west, we have a room that back then was known as the Flemish room, and this was the Flemish room in 1902, okay? I talked about that wall that created the hallway. Well, that's the wall itself straight ahead of it. So on the other side of that wall is the hallway, and on the other side of the hallway is the old cafe. So we're looking from west to east, right? Uh, this was also the ladies' dining room, and it stayed the ladies' dining room between 1870 and then 1910. All right. But again, you can see this beautiful paneling that we would call wainscoting. And usually wainscoting, if it's anything less than five or six feet from four up, is considered wainscoting. Above that, it's paneling. Uh, again, beautiful light fixture, wonderfully carved door frames, architraves. Um, the wall decoration looks to be hand-painted wallpaper of some sort. I uh, can't prove it or disprove it. Uh, wonderfully large, solid table with chairs. And look on the left-hand side. There's the fireplace. Look at that mantle and the open mantle. Just monstrous. Really more Edwardian than Victorian, right? Although this was technically still a Victorian period, but so it's called pre-Edwardian, if you will. All right, and you can notice that either side, the flanking the fireplace are built in cabinets where you would hold the dishware, the glassware, and the silverware, and things like that, okay? And that were used in the room itself because there was no storage cabinet built into the room. None of the rooms had their own storage cabinets, right? That was pretty much down on the floor below. Okay, um, I would point out that piece of furniture uh, in the left-hand corner, we still have it, by the way, up on the second floor. Uh, and also notice in the fireplace, uh, in the hearth itself, you have wood logs. They're still burning wood at that point in time, so. All right, so what does the room look like today? Ta-da, here we are. All right, so this is what we call the Cafe Murda. Same direction as the previous photograph, from west to east. You can see we now have a new mantle, all right? Uh, because the old, actually the room was basically gutted in the 1950s to create what was called the main office. And but it was returned to a dining room in the early, in 2005, 2006. So no over mantle, the beautiful artwork in that room. And instead of those cabinets that flank the fireplace, we have the banquettes, which you also see on the right-hand side. Of course, the ceiling is very undecorative because it has, uh, it functions more as a conduit for HVAC, air conditioning and heating, if you will. So, so that is the old cafe, I'm sorry, the cafe murder today. All righty, so we're next. Ah, okay. So the Wi-Fi Cafe today, right? So you can see the door on the left-hand side. If you open that door, you're in the Cafe Meredith, all right? So this is the Wi-Fi Cafe as it looked in 1902, and it was called the Colonial Room. I have no idea why, because it, there's nothing colonial about the room itself, which is really interesting. But again, take a look at the mantle and the mirror for an overmantle. But uh, you know what? All right. Uh, that's a very Georgian overmantle, if you will, okay, with a pediment on top. But I think that's about as colonial as something gets. So uh, wainscoting, uh, painted ceiling, same vaulted ceiling, still there, all right. Um, you see that stained glass in the door on the right-hand side? That is now in the Cafe Meredith, all right? Because where that doorway is there is now a cabinet that has moved around a few times between the different rooms, so. But nonetheless, this is the Wi-Fi Cafe in 1902. And voila, the, the, the Wi-Fi cafe today. So you pretty much have, let's go and take a look at that mantle, all right? Same, same mantle, same tile, okay? But that's it. All right, wainscoting still there. We have that beautiful cornicing, and look at, and now we have a painted ceiling again, but it's it's done in this beige color. Then it was in, in blue, all right? And obviously, uh, the furniture has changed. So, and there you see, if you look at the doorway on the left-hand side, you'll see how that was the hallway that went into the main hallway through that swinging gate, okay? So there's the Cafe Murdoch through that door. Okay, all right, so that's, that was the West End 
on the northeast, the northwest corner of the, on the first floor of the Broad Street building. So let's go across the hall. So this would be the southwest corner into the restaurant. So this was the a la carte dining room for the league in the 19th century. All right. Uh, the door you see on the left hand side went into a pantry that then led downstairs to the kitchen because the kitchen was underneath the restaurant. What a brilliant idea, wasn't it? Um, and you can see the, man, the, the fireplace itself again, small, plain, Victorian with a large mirrored overmantel. Again, a wonderful light fixture, you know, electrically, I'm sorry, gas layer. But look at that ceiling. Once again, Herzog just knocked his socks off, I think, decorating this room. Um, in terms of the stenciling color, you can imagine all the different colors in there, including gold leaf and silver leaf and things like that. And then on the right hand side, windows. There were two windows on the Moravian Street side of the building. And that's what you see there. Okay, so that's a flat wall with two windows to it. Uh, otherwise, it looks like a restaurant. White linen, tablecloths, chairs from the tables, and things like that. Okay, all right, moving on. This is the room in 1902. You can see how it has changed, and it has changed. So the fireplace has gone uh, replaced by this brick mantle with an overmantel. And as an overmantel, we have both a mirror and a painting. All right. Uh, the doorway is gone because the pantry no longer exists. Uh, but the biggest change, obviously, is the south wall. What was a wall with two double hung sash windows now has the bay window. All right. You can see it's got one, two, three, four, five. Uh, Vertical, panes of glass in it, all right? Uh, the chairs look, are the same, actually, and I'm sure the tables are the same as well. The space is the same, okay? All right, and this is what it looks like in 1962. Okay, so by then it was called the Cafe Murdoch, believe it or not, the, or the Murdoch room, forgive me. Uh, again, another room that was redecorated by Vincent Kling's architectural firm, or not Kling himself, and, there, and the, the bay window was still there, but that's about it. Really different room. Uh, furniture, crockery, plates, glass, all made for this room specifically, uh, but all gone at the same time, unfortunately. Uh, so this was a really, I think it's a pretty neat room, don't you? I, I actually like to look at it for a very modern 19, for 19, early 1960s room. So good stuff there. And what does the room look like today? Uh, here we go. It is the business center. All right. And the only thing left behind again is the bay window. Otherwise, it's <laughs> everything else is gone, as you can imagine. So. So that's, that's that. All right, we're going to go down the hall to the southeast corner of the building. And when you walked in the building in 1865, it was a smoking room, and it's still a smoking room today. It hasn't always been. There are a few, maybe about 10 years it wasn't, but by and large it still is. So this is the smoking room in 1962. And, you can, and it looked much like the parlor, so if you can't see one parlor, you've seen them all. But in 1962, this room was very different. You can see what it looks like now. Uh, wainscoting, all right, paneling. Right. And what you see here, though, is Honduran mahogany, because in 1927, uh, the room was gutted by a fire. They were doing some work in the room, and the workman's cloth, full of linseed oil, uh, self-combusted and gutted the room. So this is a recreation of the 1892 room to what it was that thought it would have looked in 1928. So uh, the window treatments, those pelmets with the heavy, heavy, heavy drapery going down the side. Uh, the furniture is pretty, uh, pretty standard stuff, if you will. Uh, the fireplace and the overmantel, obviously, it's a, it's a very different fireplace, smaller fireplace with a mirror for an overmantel. Uh, but the biggest change here is the wall treatment. That is actually brown leather, believe it or not. Um, and you had to see it to believe it. Uh, it was still, when I went to the league in 1970, it was there on the walls. And it, it gave them a very unique look and feel. Um, and that's all right. So, so as we know, it doesn't look like that today. So let's see what happens. So this is the room. The leather is gone, uh, replaced by a really wonderful wall treatment instead. But the wainscoting is still there. The coffering is still there. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see those bar stools because now there's a bar against the south wall, and then a wonderful little bar it is. And then the rest of the room is just uh, you know furniture. You know, uh, you can see the the upholstered chair set around the fireplace, and then the dining tables and the other on the opposite side of it, lighter colored upholstery chairs. So it's a really neat room. And of course you have the entrance, which is an, actually an airlock to keep air from going from the smoking room out into the hallway. So, okay, that's the smoking room today. So we're going down, we're not gonna go to the second floor today. We're gonna to go to the 
ground floor was otherwise we'd be here for another hour too because I can I can talk I talk too much about this stuff anyway. So on the right hand side of the photograph, you see those two columns and they flank the staircase that is still there today. You can go down those stairs and you will see those very same two columns. They are there. But what you see is something called the Oyster Cafe. So there was no hall there was no hall. This is not a hallway. This is actually part of the dining room. Um, you walk down the stairs, you turn to your right, and there's, keep in mind, there's no doorway on Broad Street yet. That wouldn't happen until 1911, and this is 1902. So um, it's just a large dining space. And again, you see the Raggett's chairs, right? Okay. Uh, and looking, we're looking south into what today is the Hewer Rooms. That's our exhibit room. But you can see what it looked like in the 19th century and early 20th century as an a la carte dining room, all right? Um, because if you looked, if you go back out into the, what we think of as the, let's call it the entrance hall where the stairwell is, and go down the hall, immediately past that room on the left-hand side is where the kitchen was located. So you had the kitchen conveniently located in relationship to, its, to the two restaurants. And look at those gorgeous columns. They're actually still there, but they're buried behind an, a facade that was uh, created in 1911 when this space became the ladies' lounge and ladies' dining so that be that as it may. Okay, so 1902. And this is the room today. That is the Hewer room. And today we use it for exhibits. Right? So, and again, there are those you know, upholstered benches we talked about earlier. So, um, and this room was redecorated uh, when the Heritage Center was created uh, between 2009 and 2011. And this was meant to resemble a late 19th century Second Empire style room. So that's wallpaper on the ceiling, but paint on the walls. And the coffering that you see there, you can go back up. It was there in 1902, it was there in 1865, and it's still there today again. All right? Okay, so we're gonna go across the hall. All right, barbershop. Gotta have your haircut, right? So this is the northeast corner. So the parlor is up above it, all right? To put that in perspective. And you can see that fish scaled leaded glass uh, window treatment. It's still in there, all right? Which is kind of neat. And we saw, you saw it in both rooms, actually, because it's still there. Uh, this is what a barbershop looked like in the, at the turn of the 20th century. Like, pretty neat stuff. But pretty, very plain, very utilitarian, and, uh, and, and just all about getting your hair cut. Nothing fancy or nothing, or nothing special about it. But what comes next? This is the Sander room, all right? So uh, as you look on the right-hand side, you can see the, what we call the rotunda today. So that is now a central hall because that, there is a door now that leads out to Broad Street. So that creates the hallway itself. And um, this is the Sander room today. Now it's a, it looks a little different. Most of the furniture is still there, but not, those, not that table. We still have the chairs, but not the table. Um, otherwise, it is just a spectacular room, all right? And, and again, it was, it was actually uh, designed by a lead member named Barbara Everlein. And she went back to the, the 1890s, shall we say, late Second Empire, okay, to, to grab the style and impose it on these rooms. And it was, it's a wonderful style. And so that's it for today. I, I hope I didn't take too much of your time, um, but I thought it'd be the appropriate place to stop because after all, the Heritage Center is the home of the Legacy Foundation, which brings us, all of us, and I hope you're enjoying them, these Mondays with Monday episodes. So, so, um, so that's it. So thank you for watching again. I hope you've enjoyed our little walk through the Broad Street building. We'll go to the second floor the next time around. And then maybe then we can go to the annex as well, because there's some fun photographs that, from that, especially since the space no longer exists. So we'll see what happens there. So everybody, um, enjoy the hot and humid Philadelphia summer that we're having. Uh, but most importantly, um, take care of yourselves, because it's still dangerous out there. So be safe, stay well, and take care. And thank you for joining us once again.